Next Sunday, I will not be here with you. I have, I get to see my son, I get to see my daughter-in-law, get to see my middle daughter. I have three grandchildren I get to see next week. And I am looking forward to that. But I know when we get together, there are going to be certain topics that I am going to avoid. Politics being one of those. There are some other things as well. But we want it to be a wonderful occasion where our family gets together as family and we just enjoy each other's company. And I hope as the holiday seasons are starting up, you have that same kind of experience. And sometimes, sometimes when you gather with family, you have to agree that certain things are just going to be ignored. The book of Amos, chapter 3, verse 3. Do two walk together unless they have agreed? We are together with God. We all want to dwell with Him and to be part of His kingdom and to be part of His family. And that means that we are in agreement with God. If you go to the book of Psalms, there is much that is said in Psalms about the wise and the foolish. Psalm 1 is an example where it talks about that wise person who meditates on the law of the Lord both day and night. That he's walking in God's counsel, not the counsel of the ungodly. Because that individual, as he studies and as he learns and as he understands the law of God, he wants to draw closer to his God. He wants to be in agreement with his God. He wants to dwell with his God. Now, you contrast that with Psalm 14. We're going to be in chapter 15, but go back one chapter to Psalm 14. Won't read all of it. But there's certainly a contrast there between the person that wants to dwell with God, that wants to be in agreement with God, that wants to walk with God, and the fool. Listen to what the psalmist said. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Now, I don't know about you. I want to be the person that we're going to talk about today in Psalm 15. I do not want to be that guy that's talked about in Psalm 14. I want to acknowledge who my God is and my life goal, and I hope it's yours as well, is to dwell with God. And yes, that is implied in the the life to come, in the sweet by and by. But I want to dwell with God now in his family, in his church. And that means that there are certain qualities and certain characteristics, <coughs> excuse me, that I must have if I'm going to be pleasing to God. Let's look at this. Psalm 15, verse 1, we have a question. And it's a question that you need to ask. It's a question I need to ask. It's a question that every human being needs to ask. Oh, Lord. Who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? To state it another way, do you and God walk together? Are you living a life, conducting yourself in a way that God looks down upon you and says, I'm proud of you. Where God looks at you and goes, that's how I want my people to be. If we are, 
if we are living according to his plan, then we do dwell with him. He abides with us and we abide with him. But if we're not living that way, should we really expect for God to dwell with us? John would talk about over in John chapter 1 that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Not any. I do not want to be a dark stain on God's glory. Do you? I do not want to be a shadow that somehow imposes itself on the dignity of God's family, of the dignity of God's church. Now, we have the question. What we need now is the answer. This particular psalm is set up in a very unusual way. You're familiar with the concept, if you want to learn something, if you want to emphasize something, one of the tools you use is repetition. Repetition. One more time. Repetition. And if you keep repeating it, it sticks. A lot of us remember uh, being in elementary school, spelling class. And the teacher saying something to you about, I want you to write each of these words out on our spelling list ten times each. And you can hear in the classroom, Ugh, not again. Well, as boring as that might have been for a lot of us, that's how we learned how to spell. By doing that over and over and over. In this particular psalm, there are three sections that make up the answer to the question of who can dwell with God. In the prayer that I led before this lesson, I mentioned to you the three points of this morning's sermon when it comes to that conduct. What we say. How we act. And how we treat others. That's it. You go to Matthew 25, that, that parable that Jesus gave about the separating of the sheep and goats. And a lot of the things that are listed there where he used, that he used his criteria to separate them. It goes back to, what did you say? What did you do? How did you treat others? Oh, please understand, God wants us to have right theology. God wants us to believe what he says is true and accurate. God wants us to keep his commandments. God wants us to worship in a particular way. God wants us to serve in a particular way. Not denying that in the least. But if you look at Psalm 15, if you look at Matthew 25, if you look at Micah 6, and there's a host of other passages, it always comes back to what you say, what you do, and how you treat others. Catching on to that repetition thing? Let's look at verse 2. He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart. Take them one at a time. You're going to find as we read through these three sections, the order can be a little different, but all three are there. He mentions first here about walking blamelessly. One of the qualifications of an elder, one of the qualifications of a deacon is that they have to be blameless. Now, we know that none of us are perfect. So what does that mean? It means you look at that individual and you see how they treat others. You see how they behave themselves. And there's not an accusation you can make against them that's going to stick. They don't claim to be perfect. They just simply claim to be serving a perfect God that they want to please. Reputation. So to be blameless, he continues, to do what is right. 
Oh, my friends, we live in a time when people say what is right is actually wrong, and what is wrong is actually right. And it seems like sometimes that the majority determines what is right. Nothing could be further than from the truth. God determines what is right. God determines what is wrong. And we can debate about different issues and how this applies in the 21st century and so forth. But if God said this is right, then that's what I need to be doing. If God says this is wrong, then simply don't do that thing. It's that basic. It is that simple. Thirdly, he talks about one here who speaks truth in his heart. That phrase there about in his heart. I can say something to you and it be a bold-faced lie. And you may never realize that because that's David. He's the preacher. He's, you know, whatever he is. He's somehow got an insight. No, I don't. I'm no smarter than anybody else in this room. But I can say something or maybe you can say something to me and I might just believe it and you're just telling me a big one. But you know, when you tell a lie or you tell the truth, you know inside yourself whether it's true or it's a lie. You know. And he talks about here of speaking truth. But where does that truth originate? It originates in the heart. I am going to speak to you, as Jesus would talk about, from the issues that come from the heart. And he would speak in, in, the, in the Gospels about that very concept. Because the, the Jews were all about, if you eat pork, then that, that will defile you. Or if you do this, or if you do that, then you are defiled before God. And Jesus said to them, hey, my disciples are out here, they're picking corn, they're eating, they haven't done anything wrong. But you know what? It's not what you put in the body that defiles you. It's what comes out of the mouth because the mouth reveals what the issues of the heart really are so again you want to dwell with God you want to walk with God you want to live with God you want to please God you want to be in agreement with God then what are you saying what are you doing how are you treating others Let's move to verse 3. He's going to restate them. Again, the order may be a little bit different. This individual who does no slander with his tongue, does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. What you say, what you do, how you treat others. The idea of there's not any slander on this individual's tongue. He, he doesn't take advantage. Might help if I fast forward my slides there. That, you know, every once in a while I get so into a lesson, I forget to do what I'm supposed to be doing. Happens often. Okay, anyway, he does not slander with his tongue. He does no evil. He doesn't treat people poorly. And he doesn't take advantage of a friend by twisting the facts, if you will. Same three things we're talking about. Now, at this point, there's a bit of a, we'll call it an interlude in this psalm, where he gives a guiding principle. It's got everything to do with, again, you can say it with me, what we say, what we do, and how we treat others. You didn't say it with me. Let's try that again. What we say, what we do, and how we treat others. Who do you admire the most who do you want to be like there's been a lot in the news lately about a little bird that tweets twitter okay it's supposed to be a joke apparently that crashed twitter and there's facebook and there's instagram and there's all this other social media stuff and sometimes it's like you're on facebook i have this many friends 
Really? You know, if you finish life and you can fill up one hand with true friends, you are a blessed individual. We have somehow separated or confused a friend with an associate or somebody that's an acquaintance. Friends. Or we have celebrities and athletes that have thousands and thousands and thousands of people that follow them on Twitter. And they'll put something on there. I tied my shoe by myself this morning. And people are like, I am so amazed. Why do we follow those folks? Because they're famous? Because they're rich? Because they have some kind of notoriety? Because they have their picture on the paper, in the paper? Or they are a celebrity like a, somebody who's a singer or somebody who's an actor or actress? And we are enthralled with those people. Why? Just because you may have some level of notoriety and just because you can tie your shoes by yourself does not mean you're really all that special. It just means that people look at you and they're just like enthralled by you. And some of those folks, and I'm not trying to be judge and jury, that are so famous and have so many followers, let's see if I can think of a good basic word. They're jerks. And you know that because you look at the way they're living. Well, this is my favorite singer. Well, listen to the words of that song. Let me tell you what. They're not singing holy, holy, holy. It's more like unholy. But I love them because that's my favorite, favorite singer. So what's the guiding principle? In whose eyes a vile person is despised. But who honors those who fear the Lord. How is it that people can give so much praise to people that do wrong and be apathetic towards somebody who's trying to live right. What's the criteria you use to choose those that you admire? Is it because they did something helpful? Is it because when they speak, it's wholesome speech? You see what they do? And they're showing kindness and generosity. You see how they treat others. And you see warmth and compassion. Or do you have somebody who's like, it's about me. Look at what I've done. No. A person that wants to dwell with God. A person that wants to live and walk with God is going to look at what's wrong and recognize that it's wrong. And they're going to look at what's right and brings honor to God, and they're going to cling to that and treasure that. What do you cling to? What do you treasure? What do you enjoy? What's precious to you? Would you rather be, and this is a difficult question. I know as I ask it, it's a difficult question. Would you rather be with God's family? Or hanging out with some of the people you go to school with and that you work with? Who might not ever show up in a church building who might do some things that you're like, eh, that's, I know that's wrong, but I really like that person. They're so much fun. 
Maybe we have to ask ourselves that. Otherwise, how are we different from the world? If we are accepting of things that are wrong, how does that distinguish us from the culture and the world around us that is antagonistic against what is right, what is holy, what is from God? Now, back to verses, uh, the end of verse 4, the beginning of verse 5. He repeats the answer again. The question, who can dwell with God? Here's the answer for the third time. It's the person who swears to, to his own hurt and does not change. Let me explain what that means. You make a promise. You go into a contract, an agreement with somebody. And you wind up losing money on it. Or you wind up some way being impositioned by that promise. And you do it anyway. You want to dwell with God? You have that level of integrity. I made this agreement. I made this promise. I said I would do this. Whoops. Things have changed. I'm still going to do it because my word matters. Or he says, who does not put out his money at interest. I'm not going to take care of you uh, or take advantage of you. If you are in a financial strait, because at some point I might be there. It's not about who's got the most money in the bank account. It's not about how to gain another dollar. Because, you know, come the end of this life, it doesn't matter how much money you have in your bank account. How much are you going to take with you? None of it. You're going to leave it to other people. And they may or may not appreciate that the same way you did. But it's not yours anymore. But I got to make that, more, that next dollar. I got to do this or I got to do that because that puts me financially ahead. And if that means I have to do some things that are a little bit unscrupulous to get that dollar, well, I'm good with that. Well, you may be good with that. God isn't. The third thing you mentioned is do not take a bribe against the innocent. I'm not going to make somebody look bad so I get ahead. I'm not going to do something dishonest or under the table that's going to make somebody else look bad or take advantage of them. Three times in this psalm. Three times. He says, you want to dwell with God? Then pay attention to what you say and what you do and how you treat others. And that brings us, brace yourself, brace yourself. That brings us to the end of this psalm. As people look at their watches. The fifth verse he who does these things shall never be moved. What it says. You live your life with God as your focus. You live your life wanting to please God. You live your life with the goal that when this life is over, I want to be in heaven with the Father, with the Son, with the Spirit, and with that heavenly family. I want to be there, and I can't get there on my own. I need the grace of God. And you live your life with thanksgiving and joy because God has been so incredibly good to you and has given you every spiritual blessing in Jesus Christ. And if that's your focus and your purpose and your direction, you know what? It doesn't matter what happens in this world. God's still with you. Isn't that what he said? 
Oh, it would be great if all of us always had smooth, easy kind of days. Anybody had one of those recently? For, for a lot of us, oh, by the way, I will stand before you this morning with my hands raised high. They'd go higher if I didn't have this jacket on. Which means the shoulder is doing really well. And I did have that lithotripsy on Friday. And in the words of the kidney stones, this too shall pass. I am happy to be standing here this morning, and guess what? I don't hurt. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to be running back and forth across here and dancing a jig or anything like that. I don't hurt. And some of you are going like, I'm glad you can say that because I'm, I'm feeling a little tight today. Or, you know, the Sidus brothers, Burr and Arthur, they came to visit you. For those of you that didn't get it, Burr, Sidus, Arthritis, okay. And they came to visit, and you can't get them to leave. And so you, you have days that are good. And you have days that are bad. Don't ever, ever ask the question on a bad day. What is going to happen next? Because that's an open door invitation. It can't get worse than this. Oh, yes, it can. So you're having a good day. Thank God. You're having a rough day. Thank God, because you're not enduring that day by yourself. God is there. And if we trust in him, no matter what the diagnosis, no matter what the injury, we'll manage. It may be something that eventually takes us out of this world. Now, I, I like being alive. Please understand that. We're not going to get a group up today to go in the van. But, you know, Lord, come quickly. Older I get, that new body sounds better and better all the time. I, I would not be disheartened if the Lord came today, would you? Well, I got things planned this week. Can we at least get through Thanksgiving? I've already been Christmas shopping. Can we wait till the first of the year? Some things you have no control over. And when God determines it's over, it's over. So whatever happens in this life, even if it's a diagnosis that you can't be cured of, you're going to walk that journey from this life to the next with the Lord himself. Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? You're with me. You're with me. So, guard what you say. Guard what you do. Guard the way you treat others. You won't be shaken. You won't be moved. You're going to stand strong. Maybe not physically. Maybe not emotionally. But you're going to stand strong. Because it's like Paul said. I know what it's like to have plenty. I know what it's like to have nothing. But I can do all things through Jesus Christ. Who gives me strength. Maybe. 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 What you and I need to be focused on. As we think about dwelling in God's house. That it really is like the song that we're about to sing. It's about trusting. 
And it's about obeying the Lord God Almighty. And you show that trust and you show that obedience in what you say, in what you do, and how you treat others. Let's bow together, please. Father God, it is a good day. And whether it be chilly today or whether it be raining later this week or whatever the weather is, it's a good day. It's a day that we got up and we're able to be here. It's a day we got to worship with our brothers and sisters and lift praise to you. It's a day that we got to share with one another and to show one another and to say to one another how deeply we care for each other and how much we love and adore you. Father, we are imperfect people. It's why we're so thankful that you gave Jesus on the cross for us. And because we're imperfect, Father, in this life, we're never going to get it completely right. None of us are that good. But you are. And it is your righteousness, not ours, that makes the difference. So, Father, help us to live with appreciation, with joy, with a sense of, of honor toward you. Because you have provided what we need for the day. And because you are so good, Father, and because we want to glorify you and honor you and praise you. Help us, Father. Help us in what, our, what we say. Help us, Father, in what we do. Help us, Father, in the way we treat others. Because, Father, we were undeserving. And you promised salvation. You reached out and intervened in human history. And you lifted us up out of the mire and cleaned us off and made us whole and gave us dignity through the blood of Jesus Christ. Even though we were undeserving. Help us, Father, to trust, to obey, because you are a good, good God. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen.